Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. Man, I dig that song. John chapter 5. The cure for everything. Humans have been looking for this forever. Pills and creams and potions and lotions. Physical exercises, mental exercises, attitudes, mantras. Decisions, actions, thoughts, anything we can do to make things better, to make things right. Here's the problem with our problems. We can't fix them. Amen. Thank you. I thought it was just me. <laughs> By design, the Lord allows them for a purpose. That purpose isn't for us to be able to learn that we can take care of everything on our own. Quite the opposite. The real purpose of our difficulties is to teach and encourage us to lean on our great God, to draw near to Him, to depend on Him. What does He call Himself? Back in the Old Testament when Moses says, who am I even going to say sent me? You know, he's got all of his excuses. Well, I can't talk and they're not going to believe me and I, I can't do this. I, who am I even going to say sent me? What does God say? So tell them I am sent you. I am. What a wonderful name for our God. Whatever you're lacking, whatever you need, all that you ever wanted, God says, I am that. Indescribable, undefinable. I am. Healer, sustainer, helper, friend, redeemer, savior, living water. I am is all those things and more. So if you find yourself in need of something today, mercy or strength or grace or provision or healing or wisdom, even salvation, I hope today's message resonates with you. Because today we're going to talk about the true cure for everything. Amen? Father, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you're going to show us today how this works, how our life here in this broken, fallen place is supposed to work. And I just pray that through the power of your spirit that your word would not return void today. I pray that today is the, the change, the, the crossroads, the, the turning point, the U-turn for somebody today who has been just burdened by things that they couldn't get away from. And I just pray that we all latch on to the truth today that I am is our answer. I am is our cure. May you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name. And God's people said? Amen. John chapter 5, verse 1. After these things, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. How cool is this? Miracle healing of physical infirmities is a real thing. Always has been. Ever since there's been a God, this has been a real thing. As a real thing, though, it's often co-opted. It's often counterfeited. It's often lied about by the enemy. It's often confused by, by untruths attached to the truth so that it can be a destructive thing instead of a blessing. That's what the enemy loves to do. That's what he's been doing all the way since Genesis. Just trying to take the word that exists and just tweak it a little bit so it means something else. He only has so many tools in his toolbox. He keeps using them. Why? Because they're pretty effective. Let me take the real thing of God and counterfeit that and make it a destructive thing instead of a blessing. We have these so-called faith healers. They make millions of dollars selling what they call miracles of God, right? I grew up watching that stuff on TV. That's one of the reasons it's hard to teach about the movement of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in the Bible Belt. We're so jaded by watching all of those guys on TV who took it and made it a counterfeit and made it a show and made it something they were using to, to make money and people don't trust it. People don't want to talk about it even. It's a horrible wall that our culture in this area of the world has, has built because of the counterfeit. We've got the name it and claim it guys. These preachers, they develop large followings selling the concept that whatever you ask for in the name of Jesus is yours. 
health, wealth, career, relationships, cars, whatever. I've heard some of these guys. It makes me sick to my stomach what they're doing to the Word of God. To keep the ball rolling and to keep their churches growing and to keep the money coming in, that puts them in a tough position when they're facing somebody who prayed the way they told them to pray and they didn't get what they told them they would get. That's an awkward situation. Well, they can't blame God because then what is everybody clinging on to? Everybody has to leave anyway. So what do they do? They blame the person who was doing the praying. Uh, I guess your faith just wasn't strong enough. I'm sorry. You should work on that. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Not just wrong, dangerous. This is an attack on those people. Because in their mind, this either leads to suspicion of God, like maybe he can't do what they told me he could do, or maybe he's not even real, or suspicion of church. I, to- I totally understand that. I run into people all the time who don't trust church because of things like this. Most of the time, these folks end up farther away from God than they started, which is what I hate the most. It's so hard once somebody actually pushes you farther away than you even were. And you build lines of defense and you have this jaded mentality and you don't trust anything and you don't trust anybody and then it's hard to even get somebody just to the word. They don't even trust that because they don't know what they, they don't know what to believe anymore. They were taken in by something they did believe that in name from a preacher was tied to God in this scripture. And so now they don't they just don't know if they can trust anybody. They're far worse off than when they started. And I hate that. Real problem with teaching like that is it tries to place control of the blessings in the hands of men. Instead of God, it's not coming alongside God and being involved in what he's doing, which is what we endeavor to do around here, but rather it's trying to force him to become involved in what humans want for themselves. That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. No, we would have a king, they said in the Old Testament. God said, you know, you've got me. Oh, yeah, but our buddies, they got kings. We want a king with the robes and the crown. God said, it's not going to work out well. They're going to tax you. They're going to take your kids and send them to war, and they're going to die. Yeah, but, but kings are cool. Okay, have a king. Meet Saul. (laughs) Let me know how that works out for you. It's an act of faith to latch on to what Jesus teaches us at the end of his prayer. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. It's an act of faith to latch onto that and ask for whatever you, whatever you think you need. That's okay. That's fine. But then at the end, nevertheless, Lord, I don't necessarily know what's best for me, God. But I know you do. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In today's passage, we see a move of God, the sending of an angel to perform an action. The, the healing of sickness for one person at a time. Why was it one person at a time? I don't know. I don't know we think of it we can ask later everyone there participating was showing faith that God would and could heal according to the way he was choosing to do it as you go through life and have needs and have desires bring them to your heavenly father believe he can do the miracle James tells us sometimes we don't have because we don't ask right but let him be God Let him decide if the prayer should be answered with a yes or a no or a not yet. He's really good at that. Ever thank God for turning down your request? Me too. Me too. James also tells us sometimes we don't receive the the prayed for thing because we ask amiss. See, sometimes even when we think we're coming with a pure heart, it's really a self-centered thing. And God can't bless that. It wouldn't be good for us. Sometimes our motives are off track or sometimes we don't know what actually even would be a blessing to us. It comes down to this. Let your prayers be sincere, faithful, expectant requests. Do that. Do that. Have complete faith 
that the Lord of all creation hears your words. Approach Him as though He's listening. Approach Him as though He has the power and authority to give you the blessing, and then let Him choose the blessing. That's faith. Let your faith be in God, not in your understanding of what your needs are. Amen. (laughs) Verse 5. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Okay, don't miss the importance of this. Okay? We might say, silly question, Jesus. Why would you even ask that? I think this is the one question that must be asked first before anything else before anything positive can be be provided for us by God. I can testify to you today that I have proven how important a question this actually is because I've seen how the answer affects the outcome of the situation. My answer to that question affects his answer to me. When I have prayed for strength to overcome the things that tempt me, sometimes I receive that strength, sometimes I don't. Why? Because God is wishy-washy? Not hardly. Is somebody wishy-washy? How dare you say that about me? I thought we were friends. That's why you said it. How could that be when Scripture tells us that if we ask for something in His will, we should assume it's already been granted? I'll be honest with you. It's because there have been times I've prayed those prayers without actually wanting victory over the sin. I know I should want the victory over the sin that day in that specific situation. And so I say what I'm supposed to say. But there's no heart behind it. And because it wasn't actually what I wanted. Guess what? I didn't receive strength. Instead, God gave me what I wanted. Which is not always a good thing. See? See? So this question from Jesus has a very deep meaning for me in that he used it, uses it in my life to help me do a bit of self-diagnosis when I'm praying. Do I really want to be made well? Do I really want victory? Do I really want what God has for me in that situation? When my answer is yes, I can also testify to this. When I really want the strength, when I really want the wisdom, when I really want the opportunity, no matter what I pray for that's in his will, when I really want it, I get it. Every single time. Without fail. Because he is that faithful. And so I've started looking at myself and asking myself this question. Do I really want to be made well? Do you? With whatever it is that you're carrying around today. When my answer is yes, so is his. And vice versa. Realizing that has been a great blessing to me. I hope it will be for you too. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. As with all of us, sometimes the, the man receives a very simple very direct, very easy to understand question from Jesus, and then he proceeds not to answer it at all. He just starts talking, right? He proceeds to respond without answering the question. Instead of answering the question, do you want to be made fixed? Do you want to be fixed today? He starts explaining why he's still broken. Now, I don't want to come down hard on this guy because he doesn't know who Jesus is. Later when they question him, he's like, I don't know. I don't know who that guy was. He has no idea. He's talking to God. He has no idea God just asked him this question. He doesn't know who he's talking to. So what does he do? He begins explaining his limitations, probably in hopes that Jesus will take pity on him and carry him to the pool the next time the angel shows up. And I don't blame him. That was the smart play for him at that moment. So I don't want to come down hard on him, but... I want to come down hard on us because we know exactly who Jesus is. We know exactly 
uh, how powerful God is, how when he asks us a question, he has a really good reason for that. And there's really no point in doing anything else until we answer that question. And sometimes we don't. I think sometimes we give the same kind of response. And I don't want to give us a pass on this. We know who we're dealing with, yet sometimes we do the same thing. Jesus says something that seems to imply that there's a way to overcome whatever problem we're facing. Something that if we would just choose to take advantage of the offer, it would change our reality altogether. And our response is, I can't because... And we start listing our reasons. Why it's not possible. We're telling God why something isn't possible. Let that sink in for a minute. We're telling God how impossible something is. Yikes. As somebody who's been guilty of this myself, can I just point out what a huge waste of time this is? (laughs) Can I point out that this attitude can only defeat what he's trying to do in our lives? See, sometimes God has a process. Ask a question, get the response. The response determines the rest of the story. And if we never take time to answer the question, we never know how the story was supposed to end up. I believe God wants to converse with us. I'm not saying don't ever converse with God. I think he wants to commune with us. I think he wants to fellowship with us. But I also think some of our conversations are way too long. Simple questions, simple answers. Simple statements, simple actions. A lot of times, especially with something really important, this is how God deals with us. I think sometimes we complicate things that he's trying to achieve for us because we're wasting time analyzing them as though we have some sort of understanding of the situation. How funny is that? As though he's missing something or or he forgot something. Do you want victory over that? I I think you're forgetting who you're talking to, God. See, God says there's always a way of escape when you experience temptation. Us, yeah, but I've been addicted to this or that or the other for a long time. It has power over me. I can't take advantage of the victory you say is mine. God says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power and of a sound mind. Us, Yeah, but I've always been a fearful person. I'm kind of a scaredy cat. That's the way you made me. It's just who I am. I I can't shake it. God says you are more than conquerors. We say, yeah, but I don't feel like one. I don't feel powerful. I mean, this happened and and that happened and and the other is probably going to happen too. That's just the way it is. It's... I think, I'm, I think I've peaked. I think this is all I'm capable of. Who do we think we are to disagree with the living God? Why would we even want to? This happens to me all the time talking to somebody who's having some kind of difficulty and they've come to me to to talk about it. And I say, well, here's what the Bible says you should believe or what you should not believe or what you should do about your situation. And the person having the difficulty says, I I just can't do that because, and they start this long list and I just stop them. I I don't want to hear my excuses anymore and I don't want to hear yours because I know you're wasting your time. I know you're disagreeing with God right now. And I don't want to let you do that. I'm trying to call myself on the carpet for that, and I'm not going to let you get away with it. Hey, words mean stuff. I love you, but listen to me. Stop using the word can't when won't is what you actually mean. Two different things. We've combined them because that makes us feel better. But it's not true. First step is to admit you have a problem, right? I got no conviction for you. And I'm preaching this to myself today. 
but can't and won't are two different words. Use the right one. I'm not going to come down on your heart if you say I won't do that. I would rather you say that. Let's just be honest. So we're all talking the same conversation. Tell me that. Because there is nothing God would tell you to do in here that you can't do. By definition, if he says you should, you can. Because he's not that kind of God that dangles carrots and then yanks them away. He doesn't do that. It's not what's best for his kids. And he always does what's best for his kids. This is a change in perspective that I've had to go through myself. It's changed my life. We have to stop letting our feelings, our understanding, and our perception of reality determine what's true. We have to start letting God define reality for us. Because it's His reality. We're a new creation. We don't necessarily understand all the time how different it is from what it used to be. So we need to let Him tell us. We need to trust Him when He does. We need to follow Him where He leads. And want what he wants. We're new creations, new heart, being conformed to the image of Christ. We we have the opportunity to stop being conformed to the world and instead be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's exciting stuff. I got a crazy idea. Let's just do that. Amen? That's the plan. That's the vision statement for 2019. I'm giving it to you early. We're going to go ahead and start now. Instead of being conformed to the world, conformed to our old reality, let's be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How do we do that? We find out who God says we are now. And then we just be that. Well, I can't. I know you can't, but he can. And he said he will. So if you still can't, it's because you won't. I'm kind of serious about this. But will you profess, will you who profess to be followers of Christ from this moment forward simply choose to believe that God has the authority and the power and the desire to give you peace and trouble and strength and temptation and power to have light despite the darkness around you? Will you make a decision to be that person? Because it will change your life. Will you give simple answers when Jesus asks you simple questions? Here's the first one. Do you want to be made well? Well, I'm saved. Yeah, but are you living in the freedom of Christ? Are you growing in holiness? Are you spiritually maturing? Or have, have you become stagnant because there's something you're hanging on to that's a chain around your leg and, and it's keeping you from running headlong into the arms of Jesus, something that's keeping you from being propelled forward by Him, by the renewing of your mind? Is there something that is keeping you from everything He has for you? And the question is, do you want to be made well of that sickness, whatever that is? Tonight, as part of an extended time of praise and worship, you're going to have the opportunity to to not only offer up your praises, but also to experience communion and to come and ask for prayer if you want. I, I don't ever want to define what blessing you should expect from such a time. I think healing is always available, but I, sometimes our definition of healing is a little narrow. So I don't want to define how God would define healing. Sometimes it comes in the problem being taken away. Sometimes it comes from the further strength to carry the burden. Sometimes it comes from gaining understanding as to what the purpose of the difficulty is. What is it accomplishing? I think any answers to any of those kinds of prayers that come back like that, I think that's a blessing. And I consider that healing. So I don't know what your blessing would be, but I do believe that the waters of the pool will be stirred tonight. I do. That blessings will be available for everybody who wants them. Because I believe that's who God is. And I don't mean you can have the name it and claim it, have the health you want, have the wealth you want, have the stuff you want. I think that's ridiculous. But if we come asking for spiritual and emotional healing and guidance and and strength and grace and peace and all the things that he has promised us, 
I think we're going to be flooded with it here tonight. I do. And I think the walls are going to shake in this little place when that happens. And I want you to be a part of that. I want you to take advantage of that. Here's what I want our lives to look like from here on out. As we're sitting uh, still in our difficulties or our dilemmas and Jesus walks up and asks us if we want to be made well, I want us to skip all the defeatist thoughts and just say yes. Yes, Jesus. Whatever well means according to you, I want that. I want that. Because I want us to get on to verse 8. Jesus said to him, rise. Take up your bed and walk. That's what I want for all of us, me included. When Jesus asks a question, he's going somewhere. Do you want to be made well? The very fact that the guy starts explaining why he can't make it to the pool does explain that he wants to be made well. And we're giving him a pass because he doesn't know who Jesus is, okay? And so Jesus doesn't correct him on any of that. He knows where he is. He knows what he knows and what he doesn't know. Jesus skips right to the cool stuff. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. Jesus is not limited by our perceived limitations. Amen. Unless we refuse to act in faith. See, there's the problem. There's the problem. When you really believe something, your actions show that. When you really believe that, that you are speaking to the healer, you ask for healing. When you really believe that, that God says, do this and this will happen, you do this. When I ask you if you believe this and you nod your head, that doesn't accomplish a lot. We can all do that. You've got to do the deal, man. You've got to walk. You've got to put feet to your faith. <laughs> At the moment Jesus said, rise, it was possible for the man to rise. But he still had to decide whether he was going to try it or not. Something he hadn't done in 38 years. His legs hadn't worked in almost four decades. This guy he doesn't know says, rise, take up your mat and walk. And immediately he stands. That's how it works. Whether he chose to rise or not had no bearing whatsoever in whether or not it was possible to rise. And likewise with us. The Bible says you if you're a follower of Christ, you are more than a conqueror. That is true. Whether you believe it or not, or whether you act like it or not. It's still true. So it's just a blessing laying on the table. And sometimes we just leave it there. We should be searching the scriptures for what God has told us we can do and just do it. Rise. My legs don't work. Rise. I'm scared. Rise. Love immediately. Immediately the man was made well. Took up his bed and walked. <laughs> when we know the truth according to what God has proclaimed and yet don't act as though it is true, we're expressing more faith in our perception than in his power. And that is so tragic. Tragic. No matter what brokenness you're experiencing, no matter what it is that has crippled you, if Jesus says rise and walk, rise, take your mat, and walk. Keep it simple. I'm about to read some statements of truth from Scripture that partially define who you are now if you're a follower of Christ. If the thing I read is something that you know you need to latch on to and believe so that you can be who God says you are, say amen. Okay? I'm going to read the statement. If it applies to you, you say amen. I have been justified, completely forgiven, and made righteous. That's from Romans 5.1. I died with Christ and died to the power of sin's rule over my life. Romans 6, 1. I am free forever from condemnation. Romans 8, 1. 
I have received the Spirit of God into my life that I might know the things freely given to me by God. 1 Corinthians 2. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God in Christ and I have been given the Holy Spirit as a pledge guaranteeing my inheritance to come from 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. Man. I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Ephesians 1. See, that's an easy one to nod your head to, but that covers a lot of territory. To say that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing, everything that the Holy Spirit provides in the life of a believer is ours already. We have that. And we're leaving blessings on the table, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. There's stuff God could be doing in your life and in this congregation that would blow our minds. If we, even if we just latched onto that one. I have been given a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. 2 Timothy 1. I have the right to come boldly before the throne of God to find mercy and grace in time of need. Hebrews 4. So is it a time of need for you? Come boldly. Not sheepishly. Come boldly before the throne of God to find mercy and grace in time of need. Now you can do that all day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You don't have to be here for that. But tonight, you could be here for that. We could do that together. We could do that together. And it could be glorious. Take this message with you, please. If Jesus asks you a question, there's a purpose. If Jesus gives you a declaration, it is true. If he asks you to do something, you can do that thing. Whatever it is. No matter how unlikely it seems to you, no matter how many times you've failed in it before, if you do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to his will, he will give you all the ability that you need. Every time. If it's what you really want. You can't just mouth the words. You've got to actually want it. But the desires of your heart can be yours. Good or bad. And you get to choose. And you have to choose. So do that. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the time of worship we had. I thank you for this gathering that we've had here today. Just uh, gathering together in, in your name, Jesus, to hopefully bring you glory and honor. I, I thank you for your word, which is just so beautiful and so precious to us. I thank you for teaching us what we need to know and giving us all the opportunity we need to simply trust you and follow you. By the power of your spirit, I pray that we would be able to do that. I pray that from this moment forward, we would begin to see ourselves the way that you define us, not the way we feel, not the way other people label us, not the way we were in the past, but the way you define us right now. And, and I pray that we just start living that reality. And I know we can. With men, this is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. So have your way in your people, Lord. Bless us with your leadership and, and your wisdom and, and your powerful presence in our life. Have your way. And your will be done. It's in Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. amen. Love you all.